And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. What's up, YouTube? Thank you so much for coming to our channel and checking out what we have going on. Today, we have a special show. It's the Book of Enoch, one of our favorite episodes, and we're going to show it to you guys. We normally have these Book of Enoch video commentaries weekly on nystv.org. So to check out more of them, we're going through the entire Book of Enoch, and we've already gotten through almost 40 episodes so far. So if you want to check out more of these, go to the link below, nystv.org, and check us out. Thank you guys so much for listening. We appreciate it. If you haven't yet, hit the subscribe, hit the notifications button, hit the like button, and share this video out for us. And just thank you guys so much. Tonight's sponsors on NYSTV are Joshua Watts Leather Company. Makes the best custom leather products this side of the Congo River. With anything from custom book covers, gun holsters, wallets, handbags, and book bags, Joshua Watts is the premier craftsman. Go to joshuawattsleather.com today. What would Jesus do? Well, let me tell you what he did do. He wore fringes on the corners of his garments to follow the command in scripture, which says we should wear them as a reminder to obey the commandments of God. The Golden Spool Rules are all handcrafted products done to support a widow and give people the tools to follow the Creator. Check out their great Zitzi designs. Go to thegoldenspoolrules.com. Don't forget, check out nystv.org. You know, this show is so great. It's the best, and everyone knows it, okay? They built this big, beautiful website that completely exposes the crooked fake news, okay? It's huge. You would be a low-life moron not to subscribe, okay? Everyone's talking about it, believe me. They hit a home run, and yes, the earth is flat. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. We are live, live, live with the Book of Enoch video commentary, the most extensive, exhaustive uh, resource and study for the Book of Enoch, bar none. And um, we are just excited to do this, excited to have this going. And as always, we have with us in the building... David Carrico. What's up, David? I am in the house, and I'm so glad I am. It is a privilege and an honor to be here with you on the subscription network teaching the book of enoch uh, i believe in our episode today this is some of the most compelling material we've ever looked at i agree with you and this uh, this ties in with so much of history so much of um 
the, the scriptures and, and it really brings a relevance to what we're looking at here on a, a natural level. Cause a lot of people tend to see everything as spiritual and not so much real, real things. And this really brings that in perspective as showing that this is a very real thing. So, yeah, yeah, it really is. And the deeper we go into the book of Enoch, we're beginning to see the interrelatedness and cohesiveness, not only of the book of Enoch, but also as it relates to scripture and it's really connecting some amazing dots and it's getting very exciting to me. I'm really, really uh, enjoying this. I am too, David. Let's get started, man. We got a lot to go through and this is going to be one of the more interesting uh, ones in my opinion. I mean, I always say that, but it seems like more, the more and more we get into it, the deeper we get an understanding of the entirety because we not only are going to be going over these couple chapters, we're also going to be skipping back and forward to other parts of the book of Enoch that tie everything in together. So even if you haven't seen any of the ones before, this is still one that you can uh, learn from and see uh, without watching the rest of them. You can always go back and check those out. So for those of you that are actually viewing with us live, uh, very cool. Um, you guys can ask questions in the chat and I might be able to get around to one of them by the end. I'm going to kind of keep an eye on that. Uh, but since you guys are uh, the few that are actually uh, get a chance to listen to it live, uh, you guys get the opportunity. Also, for those of you that are listening to this recorded or any other way, you guys are in for a treat. Just excited. David, get us started. All right, let's go to work. And we're going to begin in Enoch chapter 31. And I saw other mountains, and amongst them were groves of trees, and there flowed forth from them nectar, which is named Sakara and Galbanum. And beyond these mountains I saw another mountain to the east of the ends of the earth, whereon were aloe trees, and all the trees were full of stocktay, being like almond trees, and when one burn it, it smelt sweeter than any fragrant odor. And one of the first things I do when I'm looking at any passage from the book of Enoch, and Enoch is being taken on these amazing uh, journeys. And where is he at? And the phrase here that we see in Enoch is to the east of the ends of the earth. Now, you go to the ends of the earth, and then you go east of there, and that's where Enoch is. And we've talked in some of our previous shows that what is being described here is the ice wall. And I think probably most of our Book of Enoch listeners will be on board with uh, biblical cosmology. This might be new to you. But what we're talking about, and we're going to be showing some maps of this later to help people to see this uh, conceptually, but around the earth, there is what is now the, the Antarctic ice wall. And beyond this, there is land. And as we go forward into chapter 33, we're going to be getting a glimpse into some of the things that are there, and it's pretty amazing. And we've got the ice wall, and who knows how big that stretch of land is beyond the ice wall. It could be as big as what we know of here, for all we know. We don't really know. And beyond that ice wall, the firmament attaches to the earth. We've got the ice wall. We've got an area of land. Then we have the firmament attaching to the ends of the earth. And as we go forward here in uh, lessons here in the near future, probably our next one, we're going to see that where the firmament attaches to the earth, there are portals. These portals go into the heart of the earth. They go into the first, uh, into the second, and into the third heaven. And these portals and the angels that guard these portals, this is the way that the Father governs the spiritual world. And it, it's pretty amazing the things that we're going to be seeing. But where is Enoch at? He is beyond the ice wall in this area, beyond the ice wall. And we're going to see Enoch go from there on an amazing voyage beyond the Arethian Sea. And in Enoch chapter 32, let's go on in the text. And after these fragrant 
odors as I looked towards the north over the mountains, I saw seven mountains full of choice nard and fragrant trees and cinnamon and pepper. And thence I went over the summits of all these mountains far toward the east of the earth and passed above the Arethian Sea and went far from it and passed over the angel Zotiel. Now, in verse 2 here, it says that Enoch went over the summits of all of these mountains. Now, I don't believe Enoch is flying here, but what I believe is being described is in the heart of the earth and beyond the ice wall. We're going to see these portals and how they interact with the, the three heavens in the near, in just these next lessons we're going to be looking at. And Enoch has went from a portal beyond the ice wall, and he's in the heart of the earth. And we've looked at this in our lessons about the Garden of Eden, and uh, we've seen a lot of this already. So what I believe is being described here is there is a level in the heart of the earth where there are mountains, and like there's another level above that. I think this is what Enoch is describing, different levels that are in the heart of the earth. And the, the fantastic, amazing things uh, that are there is, uh, is really quite phenomenal. And the phrase here, far towards the east of the earth, this marks the uh, demarcation point, if you will, where Enoch goes upon this voyage and this journey. And when we understand this, this is explaining things physically and geographically, and this is also explaining things spiritually. And it talks here about passing above the Arethian Sea. And I believe, again, that it's like we've got a level with mountains. We've got a level that has a sea on it, and uh, it's like layers within the heart of the earth is what's being described here. Now, as I studied this and I tried to meditate upon it, and uh, think, you know, just what are we looking at here? I thought, now, I've seen something like this before. This is ringing a bell here, and it goes all the way back to a 1959 movie that I watched when I was nine years old and deeply fascinated me. And the basis of this was this fella here, Jules Verne. And Jules Verne, was a French novelist. He died in 1905, and he wrote some absolutely amazing books and material. And in these books, and I think what will happen one of these days, is we're going to do a midnight ride on Jules Verne and his Rosicrucian and Masonic teaching in his books. And it's pretty amazing. And this guy, he was writing what he did from the standpoint of science fiction, but he knew way too much. And a lot of what he was speaking of was very true and real, the way things really are. But some of his books that he wrote, they speak to these places that are these mysterious places in the heart of the earth, uh, places like the Book of Enoch talks about. Uh, one of his books here called The Mysterious Island, and uh, another book, uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and I'm sure that these are readily familiar uh, to almost all of us. These are just um, have become a basis of our Western culture of uh, movies and science fiction. This book here called From the Earth to the Moon. Uh, yeah, well, would it be possible just to sh shoot a rocket up there? Well, it might be into what was going to happen. I think he did. I mean, just judging by all the books that he this man wrote that are he, – he either experienced some of this himself or he got it straight out of the uh, mysteries, and I think that that's probably the most likely, but um, – I mean, it, it really ties in. We'll talk more about the rest of the the legend in the and what it's called, and you know the land maps and everything. But he uh, definitely had an understanding of what he was writing about. It wasn't just uh, some random fiction out of the top of his head. There's no doubt about that to me. Yeah, uh, there's creativity, but this is beyond the the pale for that. And I believe that he was getting. Um, 
not only information from secret societies, but spiritual information. You know, Tesla, uh, with his inventions, he got a lot of his material by his own admission from spirit revelations. And I think some of the same thing is true here with Jules Verne. I think it's part information from Masonic and Rosicrucian secret societies and part uh, revelation from spiritual entities. And uh, we might take a real uh, closer look at Mr. Jules Verne one of these nights. Uh, Journey to the center of the earth. And we're going to be showing you some pictures from this uh, that are really amazing. Now, the Arethian Sea, this was mentioned in the 5th century BC by Herodotus. And I think you had a quote from Herodotus, didn't you, John? Yes. Uh, the quote here, let me pull it up real quick. This is this quote from um, one of his books, and there's or one of his letters that he wrote. It says, and he was one. He's actually the first known world historian, pretty much. I mean, uh, yeah. when it when it comes down to it, but he said Hyperborea is the most wondrous land located in that part of the world, northward towards Mount Olympus, home of the gods, and where the inhabitants are much favored by the gods. The Hyperboreans are fortunate to live in a land of perpetual springtime and twilight. There is no disease, and the people live for thousands of years. These are known things. And, boy, this could really open up another whole idea of this might not be as crazy as it sounds, that the idea and the theory that we've talked about, that there are Nephilim living that could be hundreds of and maybe even thousands of years old within the heart of the earth. But this is another uh, aspect of this. But all the way back to the 5th century BC, the Eurethian Sea was known as the place that will take you to these mystical, marvelous places like Jules Verne wrote about. And we're going to be looking uh, a lot closer, and we're going to be showing you some maps here uh, in just a moment. Now, we're going to be showing... Uh, some movie slides here. And John, I think I'll let you speak to those as you bring them up. And uh, another work that uh, was famous for historians in the first century AD was Periplus. And Periplus was a Greek work. And this also talked, as did Herodotus, Herodotus about the Erethian Sea taking people to these mysterious lands and these mysterious places. And uh, this is where Enoch is in our episode today. But, John, if you will, you want to pull these slides up on sure. uh, from the movie? Sure. And uh, I think these are all now from the 59 movie? Well, the, the bottom two uh, photos there are from the 1959 movie. The one on the right there depicts uh, this portal that they basically are going to under the earth. It's kind of you know yeah. covered by water ty uh, type portal. And then on the left, it represents what looks like as dinosaurs or dragons as they are approaching this land right here. And on the top, this uh, the bottom one's from the 1959 movie. The top one is from the 2008 movie, Journey to the Center of Earth, that was re redone. And uh, on the right, you see them reading this book that has to do with this journey to the center of the earth. And uh, on the left, you see them traveling in this huge dinosaur mouth there. But those, those depictions are very similar. Um, I mean, to, it's really actually, if you read the book, the movie goes quite along with it, at least from what I can understand for from the 2000 or the 1959 version, the 2008. I'm not exactly sure. I don't know that I've seen that one. Um, have you seen the 2000? Yeah, I did. Um, I can't think of the guy, Brandon, Brandon somebody, Frazier, Brandon Fraser. Yeah. yeah. And then the, uh, 59 uh, Pat Boone and James Mason, yeah. I believe are in that. It was just a real classic. That in, impacted me as a as a young child when i watched that that was really something it, it definitely strikes the adventurous you know side of a oh, young, yeah. child, young boy because oh, i yeah. mean even today it's like i really want to go to that place and oh see yeah it's actually oh, there, yeah and that would be amazing but yeah uh, yeah and to find out now that these things are real yeah they're real, yeah. you know, and it was presented as science fiction. But as we look, right. uh, if the Book of Enoch is real, and I believe it is, we're talking about a reality of what's in the heart of the earth. And that one picture I love so much from the 59 movie where they're going out, uh, it shows the sea there. 
and it shows like there's a portal or a stargate mm -hmm. and you can see it yep. the way they did and uh jules verne and also the people that made these movies uh they uh i think a lot of them knew that it was more than just science fiction that we're talking about i think so too I and i uh, really do i mean the one show we did on book of enoch david before about the garden of eden moving to the place yeah. in the center of earth is a really important i think um one of these we did to kind of understand why this well i guess i'm getting ahead of myself we'll talk a little bit more about that but um pretty amazing i got this other slide here it's a of aquaman there's a movie called aquaman basically it poseidon uh i believe it's poseidon has a has a daughter of some sort or something like that and then she goes on land and has uh mates with a human and creates this nephilim hybrid uh that's aquaman that you see here in this photo and part of the movie in this movie he goes into the depths of the earth uh into this island in the middle of the earth underneath water and everything else and goes into this and his goal is to grab this um this trident uh so that he can stop a war that's going to be going on between the ocean dwellers and the humans and and this is the only this is his weapon. He's the chosen one for this weapon. And in order to do so, he goes into this heart of the earth and he has to speak to this giant creature uh, that is kind of like how we're described as, um, I can't remember which one's the water, Leviathan, I believe. Uh, or is it Leviathan for thinner behemoth is the water? Um, Leviathan is the water. And, and it's got this, and I can't remember what they call it in the movie, I believe. Um, I, I, all I know is that it's huge and, and in order to, get it it killed a lot of people going down there to it but in order to do it they had to speak to it which is interesting because when when i when we interviewed the guy in colorado talking about speaking to the serpent and you know entering the serpent in order to obtain this messiahhood this um you know enlightenment it kind of reminded me that in more of a physical kind of way but the way that they spoke about it was very similar yeah in in the way they talked about it so yeah and there's always this male female uh, androgynous concept bringing forth these entities and of yeah. course this is the genesis 6 scenario right. and we're going to be looking at the babylonian version of this of apsu and we're going to see also in the persian version uh the persian version <laughs> we're going to see the persian version and uh, -huh. uh this is a concept uh, that all ancient people held and they were looking at reality and um it's amazing. And of course, it had the mystical elements attached to it. And we're looking here in the book of Enoch, the real spiritual and physical realities. And it's pretty amazing. Now, in this next slide, we have, uh, you can just go to the Wikipedia article on the Arethian Sea. And as we look at this, uh, the map here on the right, you can see that the Arethian Sea is basically all of this water area, even all the way past uh, the Indian Ocean. And in the map here on the left, and this is from the 1700s, this map on the left, and it's uh, the map on the right is that which was described in, uh, I referred to the writing in the first century AD, of Periplus, and this is the map as it's described in that first century AD writing. And the map here on the left is from the 1700s, and you can see here that even uh, we've got Australia depicted down here. So what we're seeing is a huge mass of water that's being described here as the Arethian Sea. And we have here in this next slide, uh, in the map here, uh, in the previous slide, the map on the left, if you look at the upper right corner, we're going to be showing you a blow up of the little map in the upper right corner of this map from the 1700s. Yeah, that's actually the one on the top right here. If you're looking at the screen, that's the one that's the blown up version of that map. And then I just I added some other maps that were very similar to that one here but it's amazing to me that all of these maps you know ancient maps all have this place and even the 1700 ones does which added australia so you know they're trying to be accurate yeah it makes it very interesting yeah it really does and you can tell and you know a lot of these maps uh they're obviously not 
all correct in what they're trying to show us here, but the basic concept is always the same. We have in the center, we have land, and surrounding the land totally is water. And we're going to show in the book of Enoch that the Arethian Sea connects to what they call the Great Sea. And this is the water that is surrounding all of the land mass in the center. And then you see the land around the outside. You see this in these maps that are in the upper right corners of the upper right corner here of the map in the 1700s, and then this other map that John pulled up here uh, with Eden and Maru pictured in the middle. And this is just exactly what we have had in the book of Enoch, isn't it? That Enoch has been in Eden. We went through that in just one of our recent studies. So these things are true biblically. They're in the book of Enoch, and these are things that People of all cultures that tried to understand cosmology, they knew and understood these things. And uh, this is just amazing to me, uh, the accuracy that the book of Enoch speak to these things. And in this next slide, we have a map that we've looked at several times uh, it's a uh, Gleason's flat earth map. And here again, we see this same concept. We have land in the middle, all around surrounding the land, we have water. And then around the edge, we have more land. And this is what we understand to be the Antarctic ice wall. Beyond that, we have an area of land. Who knows how big? It could be bigger than what we know on this side, for all we know. We don't really know. And in the very next chapter, we saw uh, in, the, in the movie, The Journey to the Center of the Earth, these dinosaurs down there in the heart of the earth. Well, when we get into third, chapter 33 of the book of Enoch, we're going to encounter Enoch seeing great beasts. This thing fits like a glove as it goes through. And uh, uh, I believe uh, we're also soon in the book of Enoch, we're going to see uh, Leviathan and Behemoth. And I believe that's where they are even today beyond the ice wall out here in this area of land. And um, they're going to be coming back. Uh, they're going to be coming back. But after the uh, we have the ice wall, and we've looked too in previous lessons that the ice wall was not always frozen. It was originally a part of Eden. But as we looked at uh, in the writings of Ephraim the Syrian, that uh, there was a point in time when it was frozen and this area sealed off. And uh, just absolutely fascinating. But when we understand biblical cosmology and we, when we can look at the book of Enoch through that lens, my goodness, the things just begin to open up in so many directions and they just begin to make so much sense. And after this area of land, however big it might be, there is then the firmament that comes down on the earth. And there are actually multiple scriptures in the book of Enoch that talk about the firmament attaching to the earth beyond this area of land and the portals that are there. And when we get into the understanding of the portals, these portals that connect where the firmament touches the earth, they go into the heart of the earth, they go into the second and third heaven, and these portals are the way that the Father governs the spiritual world by either admitting or denying access of specific spiritual entities. And actually, as children of God, uh, you know, Jesus talked about the gates of hell not prevailing against the church. We, in spiritual warfare, we can actually have a say about that. But it, And it talked here uh, in Enoch about him passing over back in chapter 32. It mentioned the angel Zotel, and he passed over the angel Zotel. And there was an angel that was guarding access to this. But for Enoch, it was access granted, and he was able to see all of these marvelous mysteries that we're able to look at and talk about. Now, with this, let's look at another scripture uh, here in the book of Enoch, and this talks about the Urethian Sea connecting with the Great Sea. And 
in the the area there of the Middle East, there was all of the water that came up in that area was the Eurethian Sea, all up around there uh, in the, the, the Mediterranean and all of that. So in legend, the Eurethian Sea was the way you departed into the, this mysterious lands. Now, here in the book of Enoch, it talks about the Eurethian Sea connecting with the Great Sea. And I believe that this is talking about the water that surrounds all of the land that is together. We have land in the center. The Erethian Sea will take you to the Great Sea. It will surround all of the land mass. And then beyond that, we have the ice wall, patch of land, firmament comes down. I think that's basically what we're looking at. But let's look at Enoch chapter 77, verse 6 and 7. And these two came from the north to the sea and pour their waters into the Erethian Sea in the east. And the remaining four come forth on the side of the north to their own sea, two of them to the Erethian Sea and two into the Great Sea and discharge themselves there and some say into the desert." Now, this is what I believe we're looking at here. The Eurethian Sea, the Great Sea, uh, surrounding all of that central landmass. And uh, to me, that is just absolutely amazing. Do you have anything you want to say there, John, before we shift the gear here? Not really, man. Just ready to ready to go through. This is really interesting for sure. I, you know, when you read read that stuff, like, and that's why when I say extensive study on the Book of Enoch, when the first times you read book of Enoch, you read right over this stuff as if it's nothing, you know, uh, most people really hone in on a couple aspects of the book of Enoch, namely Nephilim, you know, the watchers, uh, maybe a couple other things here and there, but, um, going through this, like this extensively, this brings out so much that is just, um, to, to me, it's the mo one of the most interesting things in the world. But I, I remember reading over this so many times, not even thinking w one, uh, one other thing about it, you know? Yeah. So. And you, you don't really get it until you understand biblical cosmology. And then when you, when you look at it in that light, things really start to pop. And I, things are really popping here in the book of Enoch. Yeah. That's all we can say. Now, in this next slide, there's a book that I have here. It's called Dictionary of the Old Testament Pentateuch. And it's a very scholarly work with a lot of research in it. And there's an article here. Uh, it's on page uh, 204. And I want to read here about the Babylonian concept of that which we're speaking. And in, in the Babylonians, the water that surrounded all of the central landmass was called the Apsu. And I'll read just a little bit from this uh, Dictionary of the Old Testament Pentateuch. On page 204, it says this, In the ancient world, they had words that we translate sources, springs, and headwaters, but they believed that in the true source of all fresh water, they believed that the true source of all fresh water was the Apsu, the subterranean waters on which they believed the earth floated. The Israelites were not ignorant of these ideas, nor had they been disabused of them. Psalm 24 and 2, which we're going to look at, in just a moment. Yet we must be clear the Apsu waters have some basis in reality. And oh, yes, indeed they do. And in this Babylonian concept, as it says in this article, the Apsu was the waters upon the, which the earth rests, and it later became personified as a dragon. And in the Babylonian lore, Apsu was the dragon husband of Tiamat. And this was like a biblical twist or a non, uh, this was like a pagan twist 
upon Leviathan and Behemoth. And uh, we'll look more at the Apsu in just a moment. Now let's go to the scripture that was referred to in this article in Psalm 24. And this is exactly the picture we see in scripture. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, for he hath founded it upon the seas. He hath founded the earth upon the seas and established it upon the floods. The word of God speaks to this reality of these underground subterranean seas that are there. This is what we see in the book of Enoch. We see it here in Scripture. This was God's design and creation, and we see this brought forth in the movie, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Jules Verne wrote about it. Science fiction? Well, that's what he said, but in reality, uh, this is the way that things really are, and when we see it in the Scripture, uh, we know that that's the case. And according to the Word of God, the earth was founded upon the seas and established upon the floods. Now, in uh, Enoch 26 and 3, we see this here in the book of Enoch. And I saw towards the east another mountain higher than this, and between them a deep and narrow ravine. In it also ran a stream under the mountain. So we have waterways underneath mountains. We saw in our text in the book of Enoch, Enoch going over the mountains and going over the seas. And when we begin to put this together, we understand that's what we're looking at. We're, we're looking at the, the hollow earth, which isn't so hollow, and the different compartments and all of these things that we see that are there. In uh, Enoch chapter 30, it says here, and always there's this association with water, with paradise. And in the Word of God, we know that uh, in Ezekiel 47 and also in the book of Revelation, it talks about the water that comes out from the throne. And there's always this mass of water. And in our lesson on the, the Garden of Eden, this water flowed into the earth and it branched off into these four rivers as it, uh, as it came into the earth. And here in Enoch chapter 30, it says, and beyond these I went far to the east, and I saw another place, a valley full of water, and therein there was a tree, the color of fragrant trees, such as the mastic. And in these passages into Eden, uh, Enoch got to see the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, and amazing things that this amazing man was granted to see. Now let's look at Psalm 104. And it also, and there's always this association of a multitude of water where God is. And this is because of the reality, and it's a physical and a spiritual reality, that out from under the throne flows the water, uh, according to a, the book of Ezekiel and the book of Revelation. In Psalm 104, bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretchest out the heavens like a curtain, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters. Have you ever noticed that before? Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. And these waters, uh, and the Erethian Sea is like an extension of the waters that flew out from the throne, flowed out. Now, in Psalm 148 and verse 4, and we know in our, in our concept of cosmology that we have three heavens. We have the heaven which has 
the air which we breathe in which we live. We have the second heaven, which has the seven, the heaven luminar heavenly luminaries that we see when we look up at night. And then we have the third heaven, which is above the firmament. And according to scripture, there is water above the firmament. Let's look at it. Praise him, ye heaven of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. And why are there waters above the heaven? Because that's where the throne is. And there are waters that are pouring out from the throne, according to the word of God. Now, we're going to look at Asp Apsu uh, a little closer. And in the, the Babylonian count, as we said, Apsu slayed Tiamat. And that's what's being pictured here in this old Babylonian clay tablet to the left. And over here we have a depiction of a dragon, Apsu. And Apsu, in the Babylonian account, it was the waters on, on a on a, which the earth was founded, uh, a spinoff and a perversion of Psalm 24, verse 1 and 2. And this was the source and the understanding to Babylonians of where all fresh water come from. And this dragon, Apsu, became the husband of Tiamat. And of course, this is the Genesis 6 scenario. And as Apsu mated with Tiamat, there was all kinds of strange creatures that come forth. And these are many of the legendary creatures that we read about uh, in literature, the Kraken, and uh, many of these that strange creatures that we see. Now, this is what is called Bahamut. It's kind of a cross between Baphomet and Mahabon. And this is a Persian version. We told you it was going to have a Persian version. And this is from Persian writings. You see the Arabic writing at the top. And you notice here that the same concept and the Bahamut, uh, and we have the two horns of uh, the Ashtoreth of the two horns is Genesis 14. And according to this Persian version, Bahamut was this sea creature, this monster that held the earth up. And here again we see the, the Persians had the same idea that there was land that was surrounded by water, and then we have land on the outside. And uh, they cert certainly weren't uh, your average spinning globe folks, but all of these ancient peoples, they had the same concept. Now, in this next slide, we have the Echidna. Ek, ek not, and Not to be confused with the Echidna animal, right? So, yeah. Which and, I did earlier with the slides. It was just kind of funny. And you can, uh, there is an animal that's named after this that's kind of a little funny looking porcupine guy. But uh, John, you've got that slide over up over there. And this, in the Greek mythology, Echidna was the spawn of these two creatures that uh, are the male and the female that we see mating uh, that are all the spinoffs from uh, Apsu and yep. Tiamat. But yeah, this, this one, is one of the wildest things I've ever seen. This is just off the hook. It is. And, you know, this, this like you said, this Echidna is the same, pretty much the same, going to be the same thing in a different kind of mythology, but the, it's the serpent-like creature, female serpent-like creature that breeds monsters. But you see this statue, and I believe, if I remember right, this is in California. I could be wrong, uh, out in the middle of the woods somewhere, but this is the common depiction of this br monster breeder uh, that is there. And obviously we see Starbucks coffee, which has the same symbol on their logo so if you needed another reason not to drink the overpriced bitter coffee yeah there it is and um, yeah it, it is pretty interesting because the you know this isn't to be confused with the the mermaids or um you know the sirens this is a uh is it is i guess similar to what a siren would be uh, according to the book of enoch one that breeds with these fallen angels and creates creates monsters this would be definitely one of them uh but when you, it, it's just, it's interesting. That's in Italy. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's it's not in Italy. It's yeah. in mm -hmm. Lazio, Italy. 
uh, and called Monster Park, Parco de Mastri, yeah. Monster Park. So, yeah, and this thing is just one of the most bizarre things you ever want to see. And if you go, uh, if you Google uh, Echidna mythology, you can pull this picture up. Not to be confused with the little uh, porcupine-like animal that's named after this. Uh, monster she was known as the she viper and this is emblematic of what uh we could look at many creatures in many of the different um myth mythological traditions that depicted these creatures that were the offspring of the different versions of apsu and tiamat which is it's just the genesis 6 scenario we understand that that what we're looking at here is the uh the results of the corruption of all flesh which went not only to the human genome but it also went into the animal world and uh well yeah she she's uh, you know giving credit to producing the hydra uh which is that multi-headed serpent which yeah. is also talks about that in um the um mythology with uh, azu uh, uh what is it called again the one you were just talking about apsu apsu sometimes it was, it's called aspu too right. eight with a z exactly and one mm -hmm. of their children was one of this multi-headed serpent as well and i can't remember what they called it in in that but it's, it's basically the hydra also that uh cerebera uh, uh cerberus i believe is what it's called it's the multi-headed dog that guards yeah. the gates of hades yeah um i mean she two-headed dog so she she's responsible for some pretty uh vicious creatures the hydra is very a very vicious creature for sure in, yeah. in mythology and, and i'm trying to remember what the what it was called in um in the um tiamat mythology i believe it was called tiamat wasn't it tiamat yeah was in the, the babylonian name. version yep. it was apsu and tiamat, tiamat and later uh marduk and tiamat uh and as they go through uh, from Babylonian to Sumerian to Akkadian uh, into the Greek, there's different names, but it's all the same characters being portrayed. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one thing that the the book we've referred to a couple times, the, uh, the East Face of the Helicon. And what it does, it will take these original names of these gods from the Babylonian, the Akkadian, and whatever and it shows their corollaries how they related into the greek which yeah. we're more familiar with yeah. but it's it's all the genesis 6 scenario and when we look at this amazing uh she viper as it uh there's the idol of it there in italy this is a pretty good idea of what a first or second generation nephilim would look like yeah. we're talking about monsters absolute yeah. monsters and people are always asking like how did they survive the flood well if this story, this account is true of all this stuff, then these sea serpents and sea creatures would easily be able to survive the flood. They're used to living in water anyway. And uh, I, I personally think that there's probably more to it. We've talked about it more, but I think a lot of the creatures that we see that were like we talked about before, the ones that are reanimated from the depths and yeah. the ones that were re uh, came from the depths of the ocean, uh, that's, likely the the uh, a lot of the nephilim offspring that we see the hebrews fighting in scripture at least it seems that way to me and um you know some of these uh nephilim were as tall as cedar trees it says in there oh, um, yeah. and in depiction of mythology there's a whole race of it talks about after atlantis some of the some of the race of died and in aquaman it says that some of them transformed and became underwater creatures and they yeah. and so that I, I believe that's probably pretty close to what actually happened yeah you know? and this is the story of aquaman that he was able to survive by going in the ocean yeah. and it's just the genesis 6 scenario yeah. and in scripture it says in the flood of noah everything in whose nostrils was the breath of life died yeah. but old echidna didn't need to breathe there no and um this is an obvious way. And in the book of Job, uh, there's an amazing scripture. I might just turn to that and read it yeah, to you real quick. Um, but this is a, a, a real accurate picture of the first and second generation Nephilim as they were uh, 
corrupted not only from human but from animals. And in Job chapter 26 verse 5, it says dead things are formed from under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. Now, try to make sense of that outside of the context we're speaking of. And that word dead there is the word rephaim. Rephaim, and the word things, if you notice, is in italics. And we take the word thing out. Rephaim are formed from under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. Well, who's inhabiting down there under the waters? Well, uh, when we take the book of Enoch to be credible, we see that, yeah, we we got some guys down there and a lot of stuff going on. And uh, we're, we're looking at here, and you see, we've always and repeatedly talk about taking the Bible literally. I dare you to. (laughs) And when you really take the Bible literally and try to understand uh, when there's something here you don't understand, just like in these passages in Enoch, what in the world is that? Don't throw it out because you don't have a paradigm to process it. But wait for the understanding to where you one day do. You know, because, uh, and a lot of people, they see something in the Bible they don't understand. Well, that shouldn't be in the Bible or uh, mistranslated. Yeah, 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 yeah. But Uh no, the Bible's fine. We're the ones that just need to up our game to where we can have paradigms to where we can understand and process these things. If you're going to tweak something, probably more more likely you need to tweak yourself than, (laughs) than the words. So, you know. Yeah, I guarantee you the Bible's fine. It's my own noodle that needs a little tweak here. And exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And it, and it has to be that way. If we don't believe, if we, you know, there's people that are like, you know, they doubt, they doubt the Scripture so much and, and things. But the way I look at it is if you can doubt the entirety of Scripture, what makes you think anything you believe is true whatsoever? Um, I, I don't get it. You know, I did a debate with a fella a while back, uh, a long time ago. It was with about, it's two years ago about veganism. And he was uh, big time pro veganism, which I'm not against people eating whatever they want to eat. I don't really care, but um, he made the argument that it was against the word yeah. to eat meat, and we had this debate about it. And um, he's supposedly, you know, when we first started out, I oh, he believes the Bible. He's a Bible believer. But when it came down to it, all the verses that I pointed out to him, he pretty much threw out almost yeah. the entire scripture. So. He was yeah. being dishonest when he said he was a Bible believer because he really wasn't a scripture believer at all. Yeah. So yeah, that's the way mo- that's the way a lot of people are right now, man. It's getting oh, yeah. so so amazing. Um, in a bad way, amazing. Let's use the word amazing. I guess sometimes when I shouldn't, amazing usually is uh, has a positive annotation to it, you know. Or, uh, but in a negative light, there um, there's an attack on the word. Oh, um, it's uh, unbelievable. Attack on the book of Enoch too, uh, big time right now, it, you know, because it's becoming so uh, apparent that it's written for this generation. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know how people go. I, I don't know. I, I can drop it at that, but I just wonder how people go through and, and want to believe parts of yeah. things and not the whole thing. Because yeah. if, if I couldn't believe half of the scripture, then I wouldn't believe any of it. There's no point yeah. in in doing that. So. Yeah. And our one of our very, our midnight rides in the near future, we're going to be talking about uh, Bible text and form criticism. And yeah. basically, we're going to be looking at the two guys that are the granddaddies of form textual criticism, which is beyond the pale of what we're talking about today. But this is the way. There are so many ministries that make a ministry out of attacking the Word of God. Well, yeah, this verse shouldn't be in the Bible. This verse is out. We'll take this one out, that one out. We've got Shmuley Botek, uh, 450 verses that are anti-Semitic. we got our complete Jewish Bible, throws out 16 whole verses, and it just is escalating. Uh, they're just cutting the Word of God to shreds, just like the king. Uh, we did a teaching on FOJC, the pen knife in the winter chamber, mm. where the old king just sliced it up. And there's not many people left that actually try to defend the Word of God and get people to believe it, but that's what we're about here. But in this this text, we'll look at in the book of Enoch, uh, chapter 32, and we see him here in uh, 
coming into the garden of righteousness. And this reminds me, remember the map we just looked at that John pulled up? And where was that map from that had Eden and Moody? Do you remember, John? Uh, it was basically, so it was a, it was a Hyperborea map. Okay, of Hyperborea. Uh, but they added the word Eden because, or they added, somebody added Eden to the map because that's where they uh, believed that the Garden of Eden was. Yeah. And also Mount Maru, like we yeah. talked about, I think in the Mountain of Baal, teaching we talked about yeah Mount we maru, got into so. we had pictures i think and yes. uh of maru yeah. in uh our mountain of Baal. yeah but uh, it was basically this teaching. hyperborea map there wasn't a whole yeah. lot of difference in in the two so and but these uh these concept again are in all cultures we yeah. can find yeah. them in a north american indians uh, yeah. they all have this idea because there was a general understanding of um, correct cosmology. Well, yeah, I mean, Hyperborea, for those people that don't know exactly what it is, I mean, we talked about, we basically gave the the historical interpretations of it, but uh, it this is where we get the word um, hyper, uh, Aurora Borealis. This is one of, the, one of the words where it comes from Hyperborea, and it's pronounced um, Hyperbor, Hyperborea, I believe is how you pronounce it, Hyperbor. And uh, there was supposedly, according to them, this is a race of giants that were there um, in classic Greek. I mean, you, you can go on classic Greek poet Pindar wrote about it. Um, Herodias, the same, same stuff we've been talking about. But this this place, uh, there's actually something interesting to note. Uh, let me find this uh, annotation here so I can um, find this. But there were historians that believed that the race that lived in Hyperborea were actually the Gauls and the, uh, the, um, man, let me find, let me find this because this is so interesting. Um, and I'm sure you've, you guys have, you probably have, have studied it before. I imagine most people have, and I know I've never seen it, but yeah, um, um, I'm trying to find my annotation. I just had it up too. And you know how that goes. Um, but the Gauls are an interesting subject, something you've talked about before, possibly having Nephilim. Oh, yeah. Um, Nephilim ties. And, and that's where we get the word Gaul from Galatians. Uh, the Galatians were the, who they were speaking to, uh, what most people would describe as the uh, redheaded Viking type giants, probably something similar. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, in this book, the Dictionary of the Old Testament Pentateuch, it, in the article on the Garden of Eden, it talks about the headwaters of Eden, of where, uh, and the Bible mentions uh, Tigris and Euphrates, and the headwaters of these, it says here, um, the headwaters would evoke in our mind the mountains of Armenia between the Black Sea and Lake Van. Now, in his book, uh, I, I think it was in Genesis 6 Giants, Stephen Quayle talked about, he did a really good job of researching the giants that come from the line of Japheth, the Gomorian giants. They came from this exact area, the headwaters of uh, the Tigris and Euphrates, which would have been these original headwaters of Eden that got defiled. Um, we were teaching on FOJC, uh, uh, talking about John Bunyan's commentary on Genesis 11. And it was amazing the way he talked about how these four waters, when the river come out of Eden, it went into four parts and became defiled. And right at this point of defilement, where the after the fall, the headwaters of these waters in Eden, this is where these Gomerian giants from the line of Japheth came, which became known as the Gauls, and then they went over uh, into Britain and were known as the Druids. And uh, just amazing. These things are not coincidental, but there are physical realities that are reflecting spiritual situations that take place in the the second and the third heaven. And for, uh, for a reference for people that are wanting to look into what we were just talking about, Plutarch, he was a first century uh, writer, and he connected the Hyperboreans with the Gauls, who sacked Rome in the fourth century BC, and um, also alien alien i, I it's, it's, it's what it's pronounced alien uh didorius and stephen of Byzant, byzantium byzantium i believe 
a Byzantium. I cannot pronounce anything today. I've been, I, I ate some spicy food yesterday and I haven't been right all day today. So bear with me here, man. I, I don't, I used to love spicy food. I grew up in South Texas. Everything had to have jalapenos, all that. But man, the older I get, the more that spicy food just like destroys my, my, my body the next day. I feel like <laughs> it's just ridiculous. But uh, they also related them to the Scythians, uh, the Scythians, um, which is pretty interesting. Uh, but and then you have in Britain sources uh, Ptolemy um, and um, a couple others that relate the Celts to the Hyperboreans. So yeah. there's quite a few references there yeah. that you can find. And in the Odyssey and also in Gilgamesh, both of these characters, and I actually did a teaching one time of taking Gilgamesh and the Odyssey, both of the heroes in these books were going to the north to return to Eden. And it's the same thing. And uh, I don't think it used the word Arethian Sea in the yeah. Odyssey, but there he was there. He encountered the Kraken. Yeah. And it's all the same thing. And all of these pagan traditions, they're talking about trying to re-enter the garden illegitimately. They're wanting to go back without Jesus Christ. And uh, Enoch is the, this is why Enoch is so unique. He had access granted. Enoch walked with God, Genesis 5, 24. And after the fall, Adam and Eve ran from the presence of God, but Enoch ran at it. And uh, he walked with God. And because he did, and he loved the Father so much, and he loved his presence. He was able to have these marvelous revelations. And in the book of Enoch, it says that this is for God's people in the tribulation time. So the spiritual lessons we can learn from this, and this is going to be more readily apparent as we go on, understanding portals and gates, and uh, what we have to say about this in the, the realm of spiritual warfare. It's, uh, it could be pretty important in these last days because these guys are coming back. They're coming back. One more thing before we move on um, that deals with this. There's a guy named Eddie Hall, and he's one of the world's strongest men. And in this interview, he talks about the Hercules gene. And it's a genetic thing that passes down to where you have this, uh, I believe it's called a myostatin deficiency to where your body doesn't produce much as much of it, which causes your muscles to uh, grow much bigger and stronger than the average man. And he talks about his, you know, getting it from his mom. And it's a, they call it the Hercules gene. Wow. And a lot of these guys would be what we would describe as Gauls or, you know, ancient Viking druid type yeah. people. And they are the strongest men in the world by far. I mean, there are a lot of, there are a lot of other races that have strong people in them. But the Viking races, the these races from this northern lands, are by far always win the world's strongest man. I mean, you have the guy that played the mountain in Game of Thrones. And I can't think of his name right now, but naturally, you know, six foot nine, six foot ten, a monster of a man. I mean, hands that are you know twice as big as mine, and he has the same Hercules gene. But a lot of these guys that are world's strongest men have this. Which is really interesting, something to look up and research, but it's called Hercules Gene. You can see the Eddie Hall interview where he talks about having this gene. Pretty interesting stuff. So Yeah, that is very, very compelling. Yep. And in our text here in Enoch chapter thirty two, as we finish this uh chapter, we see Enoch coming into the Garden of Eden. And as we've taught in previous lessons, there was a scripture in Enoch that specifically talked about Enoch being or about Eden being transplanted and originally the garden of Eden was on the surface of the earth we can see in Ezekiel 31 that it goes into the heart of the earth and then we can also see it in the book of Revelation in the third heaven and uh, that's an amazing study there in itself needless to say mm -hmm. but let's read her text and I came to the garden of righteousness and saw beyond those trees many large trees growing there and of goodly fragrance, large, very beautiful and glorious, and the tree of wisdom whereof they eat and know great things. That tree in height like the fir and its leaves are like those of the carob tree and its fruit is like the clusters of the vine very beautiful 
and the fragrance of the tree penetrates afar. Then I said, how beautiful is the tree and how attractive is its look. And you'll notice here, and what we're uh, being described here is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in the next verse, in Enoch 32 and 6, and I don't believe we have a slide on that. I think I left that off, John. Do you want me to pull it up and read it? Yeah, let's uh, pull up uh, Enoch chapter 32 and verse 6. And uh, You might be able to get it to it faster than me, but I'll try here. Okay. See if, uh, see if the old internet's faster than David Carrico. Chapter... I done got it. I oh, beat you that old lady. Well, I done smoked well, you're way it. way ahead of it. Go ahead. Uh, and it says here, uh, and this identifies it as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that Adam and Eve ate off of. And yep. here it's called the tree of wisdom. Okay. Now that's uh, important for us to note. It says in verse 6, Then Raphael, the holy angel who was with me, answered me and said, This is the tree of wisdom of which thy father old in years. And you see, Adam was still alive at this point in time. Mm -hmm. uh, which thy father old in years and thy aged mother, who were before thee, have eaten and learnt wisdom, and their eyes were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they were driven out of the garden. Now, this connects with the teaching we did on the five Satans. We uh, did this on the Midnight Ride uh, just like three or four weeks ago. Three or four right? weeks yeah. ago. Now, remember this guy here, and I don't think we've got a slide on this uh, either. Uh, let's go to uh, the book of Enoch, chapter 69 and verse 8. I do have a slide on that, but I think it's later on in there. Oh, okay. It's a... Uh... It's slide 27 there, David. Okay, they're just a little out of... Okay, here it is. We'll pull this up here. Enoch 69 and 8. And this was the Satan... Uh, we'll read the text here. Enoch 69 and 8. And in the teaching on the five Satans from the book of Enoch, there were these were seraphim. There were two seraphim in Scripture, which was Satan and the Assyrian five to make a total of seven are listed in the book of Enoch. And this one is very interesting. The And the fourth Satan, or fallen seraphim, and the fourth was named Penume. He taught the children of men the bitter and the sweet, and he taught them all the secrets of their wisdom. And this demonic wisdom from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this was disseminated and is still being disseminated by this fallen Satan called Pimue. And this is the source of this counterfeit wisdom that runs counter to the Word of God. Now, I'll go back up here, and you know the Scripture. Let's look at it in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And this is what is being called the tree of wisdom in Enoch chapter 32. And you see, Enoch is seeing this now in the heart of the earth. It's no longer on the surface of the earth, but after the fall was taken to the heart of the earth. And in the, the Garden of Eden in teaching, we can see it then transplanted up to the third heaven. But in Genesis 3, 6, you know the scripture. And when the woman saw that the tree was good, and here we get a better idea uh, when we see uh, Enoch describing this tree, how big it was and how beautiful, how, how much it smelled, uh, how impressive it was. And, you know, you think of the redwoods and uh, how magnificent they are. And this was uh, a redwood tree on steroids, if you will. Just uh, we, we, we can read the words, but it's hard for us 
to really grasp what an awesome thing is being described here. And it says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, through the fallen Satan, Pimue, of Ezekiel or of Enoch 69, chapter 69. This is the dissemination of this counterfeit occult wisdom that is so very popular even today. And this is uh, in this slide here on the tree of the Seraphoth. This, as we know, is the Kabbalistic tree that supposedly gives wisdom, and this is nothing but satanic wisdom of the fallen world, and uh, as believers we know this. So don't fall for people that try to sell you this as being something of God. Now, we're going to show you this manifests itself uh, through the, the Kabbalistic teachings, and it also manifests itself through the Gnostic teachings, and I'll read just a, a couple of quick things here that uh, will just give us an idea of just what's going on here. And this is the satanic wisdom that manifests itself, and it's very popular uh, in the, the Hebrew root to call the Holy Ghost she, Sophia, Barbello, and this is not biblical wisdom. This is satanic wisdom. And um, I hope that none of you are fooled by this, but it's it's promoted big time uh, in the Hebrew root movement. This stuff open operates openly, uh, and uh, it's kind of a big satanic free-for-all out there. But on page uh, 279, uh, it talks about this androgynous wisdom that comes down. It says, Then the child, the son of humanity, came together with his companion Sophia and produced a bright androgynous light. We always have the male-female aspect. And in their understanding, God is androgynous, two parts male, and the Holy Ghost is, or the feminine goddess, which is portrayed in Gnosticism as Sophia or Bobello. This is the two-part male, one-part female god of Satan. And uh, this is the, uh, the satanic version of this wisdom that is coming forth from this fallen uh, seraphim. It says the masculine name of the light is Savior, the one who conceives all, and the feminine name is Sophia, the one concerning all. Some call her Pistis or Faith. And on page 269 from the Gospel of the Egyptians, it says, and it's speaking of the entity they call the great Seth. And we have done uh, also teachings on these Sethian Gnostic documents. But it says, uh, he may come forth and appear to this holy incorruptible generation of the great Savior and those dwelling with them in love and the great invisible eternal spirit and its only child and eternal light and its great incorruptible partner, the incorruptible Sophia and Barbello and all the fullness in eternity. Amen. And when you hear people start to talk about Barbello, run for your life because you're being fed uh, satanic wisdom of uh, from the pit of hell. Let's just close it out here with a couple scriptures. In James 3.15, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. And it's amazing how scripture describes this. And of course, in that tree of the seraphoth, it comes up out of the earth. And this is the uh, satanic wisdom that is not from above, it's of the earth, sensual and devilish. And these entities that we see in the hollow earth, they're the, the origin of this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish 
foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And with that, we're going to close this week's episode of the Book of Enoch. Any final thoughts here, John, as we wrap this up? Once again, the most exhaustive study on the Book of Enoch you will find, and I can pretty much guarantee that. I've never, I've looked and never found anything uh, very even close to this kind of study. So, um, a historic thing going on here, and uh, one day, for years to come, this will be something that people. Um, especially when we put it down in book form, this is something that people will look at and be able to, fir- you know, fully get an understanding of the book of Enoch. Um, you know, it, it, you, this is the kind of stuff, David, that I enjoy. This is the kind of st- the, the, the week, my week, you know, look forward to this moment. I look forward to this, being able to dig into this stuff because uh, doing things people have never done before, which I, I am surprises me, but it makes sense that it's a book for this generation yep. therefore people are starting to want to see or hear more of that stuff um you know it does the fact that the father put it on our heart to do this is a pretty um amazing thing to me you know it's just amazing oh, yeah. that we and and i and i won't go as far to say we we're chosen to do this but it we're the one we're doing it so i'm thankful and i'm not trying to brag or anything it's just a blessing to be a part of it so oh it is yeah i am greatly honored to be able to do it and to be able to do it with you here on now you see tv on the subscription network i know that um our audience on the subscription network that you are not listening to us because you are settled on your lees as it says in scripture but you want to go after truth and th- it's exciting the word of god uh is ex- is more exciting to me than when i was first born again and the mysteries of the it's like in the one of the other scriptures in the book of Enoch he says i want to know everything about this you know yeah. that's the way i am i want to know and i can't wait to keep pressing into the book of Enoch to uncover so many things and uh with all we know it'll be a spit in the bucket of what we'll know uh but there's so much I, i'm going to read one more scripture right. um and you know, there's a lot of, uh, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. And there's a lot of people that are peddling a lot of hokey baloney uh, out of the Gnostic and Kabbalistic text, this satanic wisdom. But there's a real reality to the mysteries of God and the mysteries of Scripture. It talks about them. And the way that the book of Enoch unveils these mysteries for us, it's really amazing. But in 1 Corinthians 2, 9... But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So I guess we can't know. Well, now let's look at the next verse. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. The Spirit and the Word agree, and through the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and the texts of Scripture in the book of Enoch, we can know so many marvelous things, and it's right and good and proper that we should know those things. This is the wisdom that comes down from above, not that wisdom that is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Agreed, and thank you guys so much for listening and on our membership network for supporting what we're doing and believing in uh, in our goal and our in our vision to really just kind of surpass and, and not surpass but bypass um, 
the powers that be when it comes to media because um, we realize what we're up against, and it's not it's not uh, it, it's kind of like when the children of Israel went and they saw the giants uh, that were knee high to them. You know, we're we're looking at giants that were knee high to these people put billions of dollars uh, into making films, um, but yet father the father's still using us as little as we 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 start we we don't. We don't look down on our small beginnings. You know, this is a beginning. Do not this despise is, the day of small things, the prophet said. Exactly. And so that's what we're we're doing. We're thankful for you guys. And David, obviously, it's always a blessing. Uh, this Saturday for the Midnight Ride, um, well, in case somebody watches this later, they won't have any idea what we're talking about. So I guess <laughs> you know that we do the show, the Midnight Ride, every Saturday. This one's going to be a good one. Um, but thankful hopefully we'll get to continue this next week i know i'll be uh out of town for sukkot uh you'll be doing your sukkot thing and so next week we're going to be playing uh we're going to be having a, a guest uh, i'll be doing it from the hills of alabama and you'll be doing it from a remote location as well and we'll move on step forward we're just we're excited and uh thankful thankful to you guys as well that are watching some of you guys are watching live there's not a lot but there's you know a, a few it's getting more and more every week watching live and um, you know, one of the things about this, uh, the website that we've been doing that just to kind of give an update for you guys that have been uh, going, I mean, it's been growing by leaps and bounds. You know, we thought that a couple months ago, David, you were like, oh, we got, you know, we need to think bigger. And this is the number we need to think at. You said that. And uh, lo and behold, the very next month, that thinking big, now we need to think bigger. So it's, yeah. it's been pretty amazing. Yeah, we're very excited about what the Father's doing, and we're excited about you. So God bless you all, and we will see you very soon again for the Enoch Commentary.